Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and we're here today to discuss all things House of Chains. We have some some friends here that we've been reading the books with, and of course, the man himself, uh, Stephen Erickson. So we'll go ahead and start off with some introductions, and we'll, we will be getting into House of Chains and all the previous books. So if you have not read House of Chains yet, uh, you know, tune out and come back later. Uh, don't spoil yourself. So, uh, Layla, will you start us off with some introductions? Sure. Um, I'm Layla Goshi. I'm a professor of English uh, in St. Louis, Missouri right now. Um, I have uh, just launched a web magazine called Bellity Magazine and um, just just excited for that. I'm going to delve into some fantasy sci-fi on uh, cultural levels, how different cultures view fantasy and sci-fi. Awesome. Me. And Mr. Erickson? Oh, well, uh, Stephen Erickson, um, presently writing uh, the second book of uh, the Witness Trilogy. So I'm a little bit ahead of you guys, obviously. Um, <laughs> and I think I've got about nine chapters left. So uh, my initial plan was to be finished in the spring, and I should be able to reach that quite easily, I think. So that's good news. Also, I'm working on a book um, on writing. So that's a, I'm kind of doing that in my off hours when I'm sitting on the sofa watching a hockey game. I'll have my laptop and I'll be I'll be writing about writing. And so that's been a lot of fun. Oh, nice. And Katerina? Um, hi, I'm Katerina. I uh, have been doing a read along with Steve um, of The Prince of Nothing for the past few months. So you might, you might have seen me on the channel here and then. And apart from that, I'm also reading other series. And um, during our read along, we got into talking about uh, the Malazan Book of Thalen. And so I'm very excited that uh, you decided that I was worth um, being <laughs> invited onto, onto this discussion. Thank you so much for, for having me. Don't forget you're a podcaster now. So don't forget to mention that. Yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> So with uh, with House of, well, first let me ask you about your, the book that you're doing for writing. What have you remembered during that process that you haven't forgotten, but you hadn't thought about in a while? What what's come out of you that you kind of forgot? It's not. I don't know if it's a question of forgetting. It's um, the book is called The Ritual of Writing, and I think it's about remembering all of those aspects that. Um, have become so much a part of me now that I take, I just, I'm not even conscious uh, of uh, what I'm going through in, in terms of sitting down to write. Um, and so what's made it interesting is I end up having to sort of keep back backtracking in terms of my thinking to sort of lay down the foundations of, of what I'm going to present as, as an argument for not just beginning writers, um, but for uh, published writers uh, who are suffering from writer's block, um, I think there are ways around that kind of stuff. And so I'm going to be addressing some of that as well. I'm excited to, uh, to get into that one. Interesting. I had, um, I had listened to um, Mr. Erickson. I had listened to an interview you did with another podcast where you were discussing the book a bit. And um, I was, um, your writing book. And I, I'm one mm -hmm. of those who earned the MFA. <laughs> I even spent a summer in, uh, in Iowa, but then, um, you know, uh, I finished my MFA and the next thing, you know, finished it in August, September, I had my second child. So things kind of, you know, deviated. And um, mm -hmm. I've mostly written uh, short stories and poetry, published that. Oh, but, your so um your topic of ritual really um appeals to me because i i get it you know i've noticed um for myself that uh ritual works for short pieces you know mm -hmm. and so i would be curious as to your thoughts about how ritual fits into a lengthy piece, um, right? Or producing a lengthy work, how yeah. it can help extend that? And... Well, well, two things regarding that. Um, uh, one is the 
and I'll get into more detail in, in the book, obviously, yeah. but um, the notion of ritual is actually based on it. You would think, you know, if people are talking about that kind of stuff, they're talking about sort of the physical preparations and the mental preparations you, you need to go into, um, sit down into your writing room. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that, but that's uh, not the kind of ritual I'm talking about. And so what I'm talking about is actually training yourself to see the world in a particular way hmm. where um, all of the raw stuff of the fiction you create is all around you. And it's there in your history, it's there in your background and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is, and it's sort of exercising your natural proclivities because I think artists are, are a bit weird that way. We're, we're not quite normal. Um, and we tend to establish a kind of uh, emotional distance. Um, and it's not necessarily a good thing, right? It's, it's, it's just something that happens. We, we find ourselves in situations where we, we do this kind of mental stepping back and we start observing and we start recording uh, what we're seeing around us. Um, which is not always a good thing, but recognizing that that is kind of a, a, a tendency or a trait, um, mm -hmm. and then putting a focus on it and, and, and putting it to use, um, is kind of what I'm talking about in terms of ritual. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, in, writer's block is not quite the same as what Stephen Earl Donaldson told me was, uh, what he called right, uh, life block. And life block is a very real thing. And that's something that we all have to face. And mm -hmm. basically it's where everyday domestic um, requirements, responsibilities and all the rest can simply get in the way of the process of sitting down to write. And that, I don't know if there's any solution for that. I think it's, um, it's something where we all have to battle through uh, in our own way. So, um, and certainly uh, having a child or, or two or three or whatever uh, is a huge life block because it's it's an energy draining um, experience. You know, as, as rewarding as it is, it still drains you. So, and you know, yeah. it, it it drains it certainly drained me, but nothing compared to how it drained uh, my wife, for example. So, yeah, I really related to uh, Tattersales, hmm. born Tattersales mother's story that um, even as um, you know, definitely it pays off to put your kids as a priority. Yeah. So I'm not sorry that happened, but um, but there's different phases in life. And yeah, Absolutely. so I look forward to reading your book. <laughs> good, good. And um, so with, with House of Chains, it, it was a, a bit of a departure from the, the previous books and that we had a, a singular point of view with Carso, the new character, uh, was that always planned to have have that one POV to start this book? Was was that was no, that happened no, it wasn't planned. That was that was a almost a knee jerk reaction on my part because uh, a lot of uh, criticisms of the earlier books, um, well, not a lot of them, but some were, were pointing out that it seems like Erickson can't stick with a single point of view, and of course, always I had good reasons for all these multiple points of view. But that kind of ticked me off because um, I can stick with a single point of view if I choose to. So I sat down and when I started the fourth book, that I thought, okay, I'll, I'll stay with Carsa and let's walk this through for a bit. I thought that worked at this uh, at this particular juncture of the of the series. I haven't read the rest yet, but um, it did give me a chance to focus. I think mm -hmm. on on one and maybe tie some threads together. And Steve and I had great fun talking about um, Carsa and uh, and his companions and the banter and the humor that mm -hmm. and that went along with it. And I said sometimes I I think I see humor where it might not have been intended, but I did <laughs> I do did appreciate Carsa being this young man out to see the world. And the boasting, I loved how he, um, you know, he kept making his vows and then his vows would um, fall apart. Like I vow this dog will sleep on my hearth. And then, you know, um, and then later in uh, House of Chains, um, I thought it was really poignant when he said, uh, okay, I'm not, I, I'm no longer going to make vows or something mm. like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, he learned his lesson, didn't he? He learned his lesson, but it was great. It's a great arc. Yeah. Cool. I also love this part um, in House of Chains. It's one of my favorite couple of chapters in the six books of Malazan that I read so far. And I especially love how um, unrelenting it is, how so much in Carson's perspective that you start with this like extremely narrow view of the world that he knows and the sort of rules, social rules that he thinks are the right rules. And he has very strong ideas on what, uh, what he should be doing, what other people should be doing. And then as you start traveling out and leaves the village and gradually descends into the lowlands, the world starts open up, opening up as he's also learning about the world. And gradually that he's realizing that uh, maybe the world isn't the way he thought it was. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's much more complicated than it seemed originally. Um, and I really love that how we go from this very narrow understanding of the world to this like really really more complex picture yeah it's um there's a lot of that tribal mindset that that's at play there where um basically there are there have been and maybe still are um tribal groups that define themselves as people and everyone else are not people um there's something else and so that's a very sort of uh, centric kind of point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think for Carsa, um, it was more uh, a case of as he traveled, reality continually kicked him in the teeth because uh, he was simply not aware of just how complicated and how nuanced um, cultures and civilizations are. And I, I mean, maybe for me, um, probably my first experience of that was as an archaeologist flying to, um, well, landing in Mexico and then taking buses and, and hitchhiking down into Belize to work on a dig. And those are my first real experiences with, um, with a culture that, that is significantly not my own. And that was uh, very eye-opening at the time, for sure. And you start realizing that, you know, things are a lot more complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, as much as I grew up in, in Canada, um, I, I mean, pretty much in a state of uh, poverty, but there is a certain level of um, support that exists in, in, in uh, a Western nation and a Western country um, mm -hmm. of, that, of that sort that simply is not there in other places. And there's, you know, a variety of reasons for why that's the case. Um, but it does, it does sort of it forces perspective upon you. And I think what a lot, a lot of what Carcer is, is experiencing um, in his journey is uh, a widening of that perspective, um, mm -hmm. hitting him again and again and again, which forces him to replace himself uh, where he is in the world. And that seems to be an ongoing thing for Carcer. Have you been, oh, I'm sorry, Layla, go ahead. No, I was going to say that that reminds me, I think, um, that's an ongoing thing for um, several of the characters, the characters where their names change. Mm -hmm. um, I see that as, um, you know, it, as they, as they f either find new skills, find new gods, um, something about their identity changes. And so their names change. And I actually made that connection because I was, um, I'm doing an oral history on something else and you know long story short someone i was interviewing who's um <clears throat> you know about 10 15 years older than me i'm 59 she was like you know identity is fluid mm -hmm. and i came into you know as i started thinking about the characters in this series i started seeing it the same way you know mm -hmm. that as something becomes more important or as something happens to them, something about their identity changes. Um, and they retain some, but they become something new at the same time. And so um, I just really dig that. And I, I, I think it reflects reality is what I'm trying to say. It's fantasy, but it reflects a, a psychological reality. 
It, it's probably the impetus for many people sort of moving from their hometown into a city. Mm -hmm. uh, they then have the opportunity to reinvent themselves. And mm -hmm. I, I had no choice in that matter. Um, when I was growing up, um, uh, it was, a, for family reasons, it was very, very uh, dysfunctional and poor. Um, and I ended up in a different school virtually every year. Mm -hmm. And um, initially, you know, that I suppose there was there was trauma involved in that uh, dislocation, that kind of sense. But it didn't take long, I think, before I realized that each time I come to a new place, um, I can redefine myself because mm -hmm. nobody else knows me. So um, I became a bit of a chameleon in that respect. And I, I just sort of explored different different approaches to to what seemed to be a, a repetition of, of uh scenarios where I would show up and within the first, let's face it, this is back in the sixties. So the first week of first week of school at recess, I'd be in a fight and you're the new kid. So, um, the, the, the pecking order needs to be established. And, um, and so that was happening, you know, no matter how I redefine myself, that fight was coming. Um, so I, I do recall, I think by about the fifth or sixth grade, I was learning to fight very dirty <laughs> and winning those fights. Um, and that just sort of, you know, you realize that even at the time, it just it, it repositioned me uh, in the entire um, classroom or community or year. And um, and that was really eye opening in many respects. Um, so, yeah, it, it's how it's how characters um, engage with the reality that they're in and how that reality changes them. I mean, it would be difficult to have, and it happens in a lot of fantasy fictions where you've got heroic characters who are effectively unchanged by anything that happens around around them and to them. And I personally, I found that very frustrating. That, that didn't seem realistic uh, uh, to me, that changes were going to occur and some of them are going to be traumatic. And, and that trauma is actually going to, you know, have a, a long lasting effect uh, on, the, on that character so yeah I'm more I'm much more interested in how we engage with with the real world um, and how that that world uh, impacts us um, and we're 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 in constant motion and uh, our place in it is is constantly changing and sometimes we can direct that we can choose that and other times it's just how events turn out yeah well, I, I've lived in a uh, couple of different countries and I can definitely attest mm -hmm. to each time being an opportunity to sort of reinvent myself or present a different side of myself to the people I would meet there. Um, but it's also interesting how different people sort of bring out different things of mm -hmm. you and how you kind of become a different person with different people around. And it's also, and then you, it's interesting when you then go back to some of the people you met, you know, five, 10 years ago. And some, and, and sometimes it's, it's like you almost immediately switch to that person that you were with them mm -hmm. when you knew them. Sometimes that doesn't work, but it's a really interesting um, phenomenon. You can be sort of a different person, different times, but also just with different people. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. almost a universal theme of storytelling where, um, you know, the older person comes back uh, into their family. They've been estranged from the family and they come back into the family and, and the expectations all around them um, want to slot them back into the old grooves that, that existed in the relationship of siblings and parents and all the rest. And But you've changed by that point, right? So you don't fit anymore uh, where, where they expect you to fit. And so, you know, plenty of films and stories uh, are all about that kind of conflict. Um, and there's the expectation of sort of being where you always were relationship wise with, with, you know, your siblings or your parents and that no longer being the case. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting stuff. I think I most strongly felt that in this book with Absalar. Uh, mm -hmm. when she makes this journey to um i mean it starts it starts in dead house case but she makes this journey to go back to it kokan to the village where she she was born where she grew up and then she sort of realizes that she's not the fisher girl that she was when she when she left and there's not really a place for her 
Um, yeah. she has to, do, she has to go out and do something else with her life because she can't stay there anymore. She can't stay there as the, uh, assassin ascendant that, that she no. is now. No. And, and I think themes of dislocation are, are certainly, you know, prevalent throughout the series. Um, many characters have to deal with that. Um, uh, Fiddler's heading for it. Um, as you, as you read further in strings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, our friend Johanna is here. Uh, excited to watch this. Oh, hi, Johanna. The second book in the Witness uh, trilogy. And uh, Mr. Erickson's familiar green room. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I, I inherited it. We just haven't gotten around to painting it. So. Okay. And our friend Daniel is here. Cool. Uh, Matt, uh, Carso feels to me like the character who develops the most throughout the series. Well, given where he starts and the fact that, that there, as a reader, you come into him very early on in his, his, his uh, creation, that, that I, I would agree that that's a pretty huge uh, arc on his part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, you know, he became fun to write with because I could throw everything at him and just see what would happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so he goes, through, he goes through a lot. Hey, right. you, th you threw a couple of sharks at him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love, I love Chris. I want to, want to talk more about him uh, here in a second. But uh, DK Moon mentioned the longer single POV adds to my reading enjoyment. That's Is good. That... I mean, it, it's intended to be uh, as immersive as possible. So, um, and I held to, you know, I, even if I look back on that section, I held to the tightest point of view um, I possibly could. So, you know, his misunderstandings of, you know, his companions, um, it's something I really wanted to hold on to so that, you know, if, if, um, Banisk or I mean, was it Banisk? Who's, who are the two guys with them? Camera. Um, Bayroth and Delam. Bayroth and, and Delam Thord. Um, you know, if they have a conversation that, that Cars is listening in on. Um, he may not, he may, he may either misunderstand it or not understand it at all, but the reader does. So there's that kind of extra engagement for, for the readership, I think. And our friend Matt had a question. Uh, a lot of characters die in the books, but a lot of these don't stay dead. Uh, what are your thoughts on death in your books? Um, well, it, it's the world building, the, the basically the, the, the structural premises that are underlying uh, the Malazan world um, is very much inspired um, by a lot of um, ancient belief systems, including, uh, for example, the Greeks, where um, they have plenty of myths about traveling um, into the realm of death and, and returning or, or not returning. Uh, and then the Egyptian, of course, the Greeks got a lot of the, their inspiration from Egypt. And, and so there, there's that kind of crossover. Um, and it, it just struck us when we were even when we were gaming that it, it gave us greater flexibility. Um, to actually, you know, it's one thing to explore the theme of death only from the side of the living. Um, I mean, that's only half of the equation. And so you run up against that wall immediately um, of the end of mortality. And, uh, you know, if our if our modern world and the West sort of views that as, as the end, then there really is nothing to discuss, right? But I, I, I'm not, I'm not one who um, naturally ascribes to that anyway. So the idea of exploring death from both sides um, just seemed to be an obvious opportunity uh, within a fantasy setting. And of course, we've got a god of death. Well, you know, what's the god up to? You know, is he just simply harvesting souls? Or is he, you know, what's his state of mind after all this, you know, all this time? Um, and of course, the deaths where characters return, they're not the same person. They have, they have undergone, uh, you know, uh, major transformation uh, of their psyche. And, um, and there's trauma involved and there's sort of an opening of the eyes. I mean, I, I don't know, go onto YouTube and, and start listening to people discussing near death experience. And, and you'll see the extent to which even you know, being dead for 30 seconds or six minutes has fundamentally changed every single one of them. Um, 
and you can you can rationalize it as this was just the flare out of, of uh, oxygen starred brain or whatever whatever belief system you want to sort of put into place there none of that matters to the person the person is changed it's as simple as that and so in the malaysian stuff i i definitely get interested and get more interested in the character when i'm pushing them back out of their state of death and back into the world of the living because then they really start getting fascinating for me I've, i found that theme um fascinating on another level <clears throat> in regard to excuse me history <clears throat> Where you know there there are voices that we heard we've heard two thousand years ago, for example, mm -hmm. that are still uh, present and still um, impacting our world today. And so, I you know that fits. I guess I guess thematically that fits mm -hmm. with kind of a perception I have anyway that you know um, uh, nothing ever really goes away. Mm -hmm things rise up again, you know, but new texts, new old texts are discovered and the voice is back in, you know, into the world. And uh, so I kind of had a sense, that's the sense I'm going with as I'm, as I'm reading. So it kind of helps to hear your perspective on that too. Well, I mean, you consider one of the earliest stories <clears throat> ever that we know of anyways, Gilgamesh, mm -hmm. it's all about that right? It's all about that journey. Um, right. So if we think of those early stories, Gilgamesh, um, a lot of the Greek myths, uh, Egyptian myths, um, if you look at it from sort of a modern perspective, you, you might call them all epic fantasy. But they are, you know, the, the origins of literature is found in epic fantasy. So it's, um, it's certainly themes that, that have been explored and will be constantly explored. Um, throughout our existence. And so for me, um, how could you avoid it? Why would you avoid it? Um, you know, it, it's, it's a central, central question of, of what it is to be human is, is think about, you know, what happens afterwards? Where does our consciousness go? Um, how, how does the experience of dying um, potentially either change us, transform us, or end us, you know, whichever view you want to take on these things. Um, but they're questions worth asking, even though if we, we don't have answers, but they're certainly worth asking. Well, I can only speak for myself, but um, I was already very emotional at the end of The Chain of Dogs, mm -hmm. but reading about Duiker coming back to life was probably even more saddening knowing you know reading the end of of uh, of dead house gates and sort of despite all the horror like at least having this comfort that finally he is getting his peace and then watching him come back into all this horror of the world um that really impacted me um, well he, co he comes and, back a broken man doesn't he mm -hmm. um and okay I, I can tell you that um his story is is to some extent picked up again, at least briefly in Toll the Hounds. So he, I haven't put him away completely by this point. So Not there yet, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully next year. Yeah. With, uh, with Carsa, uh, well, with that storyline, especially in the first book of the first book in this, in this book in House of Chains, I'm not sure if I just didn't get the humor before, because when we would discuss the books, like the first couple of books, everyone else was laughing about certain parts of it. I, like, I didn't, I didn't catch the humor, but in, in the, I don't know if it was me or if it was something that you ramped up the humor a little bit, but a lot of the dialogue and the back and forth, there was some great humorous portions in that, in that first part. Do you mean with respect to the army and the military? Uh, just no, but just about with Carsa and oh. the, the dialogue in the, in the beginning and the first book. Like I felt like I cut onto it. Like when well, Carsa, be... oh, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. No, just like when Carsa was telling Torvald Nam, uh, <laughs> you talk too much or you use too many words. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, some of the time I, I'm hoping it's clear that a lot of the humor is flying over Carsa's head. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, 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 there's more opportunity in that respect. Um, right. He's an in, in, unintentionally funny. That's for mm -hmm. sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I found humor too, as I said before, um, with Onrak and Troll Singer. I when they when they first met, I kind of saw them as like now they're on this road trip, you know, mm -hmm. like Martin and Lewis on their road trip, you know, because when they get to the hounds, the dogs, and um, you know, Troll Singar basically dares Onrak to let them go. And um, <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening there. It's not, it's not all serious. It's, um, uh, it's humor, but it also humanizes them. Even, even though Onrak is, you know, I guess neither are human, right? Mm. <laughs> but um, it uh, makes them more appealing as characters, I think, to see that side of them. Yeah, um, and certainly that's that's one aspect of using uh, character-based humor um, in a narrative is is yeah to draw that sort of um humanizing element uh, a bit more to the, the fore so that people can't be serious all the time um it, it actually gets kind of boring if a character is you know, perpetually serious um yeah. and if you end up with a character writing a character like that then you can have just absolute hilarity going on around them and they're just you know unfazed by it uh or unaffected by it i think in house of chains there's certainly um Faradan Sort, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think with the Scorpions, is that in this book? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a completely humorless character, right? And so yeah. she has an impact in her own fashion. Yeah. I yeah. think the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, uh, I was just going to say uh, that uh, the Thai Liu San are also another wonderful mm. example of that. I don't hear people talk about them much, but I found them absolutely hilarious um from the first moment they meet troll and they're like oh would you like to be our slave <laughs> uh, to the point where i think their ho horses get blown up at the at the end by the more mission they're like well yeah, maybe we'll just abandon this adventure because it's not worth our, yeah. um, that's not worth our time let's let's focus on other things <laughs> i thought they were hilarious I, I had real fun with them cool cool yeah and, you know, there's drier humor, even Tavari, I'm not sure if at the end where um, uh, Karsa says, you're not my enemy anymore, and she kind of dryly says, so oh, that's, that's good to know, you know. <laughs> well, but the reader knows that it, it really is good to know, right? Right. <laughs> He's not, Tavor is not aware of that. Um, right. So, yeah, her comment is, is certainly uh, intended uh, ironically, but um, the reader yeah. should know better, right? So right 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 the reader knows yeah so um but that you know that reminds me of something that um steve and i had talked about uh last time too which is um the the military itself i get i guess what led you to to um set your theories within uh you know within military within the military and the the soldiers on the ground versus the you know the leaders and the the plotters um, which of course are in there too but yeah well, to a lesser extent um i think both uh Esselmont, cam and i were uh react even in our gaming but that preceded um all of this we were all about sort of um unplugging the the uh, the more cliched elements of epic fantasy. So, you know, in, in creating the Malazan world, we we pushed it back to sort of late Roman Empire as opposed to medieval Europe. Um, and we were much more interested, uh, as you say, on, on the boots on the ground. Um, Gardens of the Moon certainly uh, pushed that quite a bit with Crocus um, and his impact uh, on the story um so that was that was that was a trope we always wanted to kick at um and that that idea of entire novels all about the aristocracy uh, or the nobility um we were kind of by that point got fairly tired of that stuff um and that combined with uh, two things one um 
reading a lot of uh, Vietnam War literature uh, and military stuff. Um, and then seeing what Glenn Cook was doing with that, uh, with his Black Company series mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, I mean, he's the one who sort of laid the groundwork uh, and, and sort of broke the mold of fantasy um, by by basically infusing a fantasy setting with uh, a Vietnam War veteran mentality. Uh, I mean, it was fantastic, uh, absolutely amazing. And then both Cam and I have worked on digs and, you know, uh, in archaeology and quite often very remote locations. And um, usually a small crew, you know, seven, eight people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you discover fairly quickly when you're out uh, in the bush on a dig is sort of the civilized trappings kind of slip away from everybody. And uh, you get to know people in, in a way that you would never be able to get to know them if uh, you'd met them in, in a city or, or in a classroom or anything like that. It's a whole different beast out there. Um, and at times, you know, environmental conditions or um, badly run projects, um, there's a level of, abs of, of absurdity that slips in. Um, and either you laugh or you go crazy. And so both Cam and I, we tended to head towards going for laughs. Um, you know, no matter how miserable things were, we, we could always find something to laugh about. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of attitude, I guess, um, we wanted to make sure was reflected in these soldiers who are, you know, putting, are being put through all of these uh, experiences, um, good and bad, boring and uh, terrifying and all of these things at once. Um, and humor and um, understatement being the means by which they defend their own humanity, if that makes sense. It does. And that, you know, we had even mentioned Vietnam uh, last time. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I remember myself um, just uh, being from Texas, you know, friends and and, uh, you know, their, their relatives who had come back from Vietnam and then the literature, as you said, too. And then now we've gone into 1991 and the first Gulf War and all of that. So I guess my point is, um, my point really is about fantasy, contemporary fantasy and how it relates to those um, life experiences, especially of, um, writers you know for example wheel of time the um author was a vietnam veteran robert jordan and um ptsd was a focus you know and so as i'm reading this i am as i'm reading your series that kept coming back to me what was that um vietnam experience and then and then the experiences uh forward so um it seems like it's fantasy, but there's a, a lot of reality to consider, I guess. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Um, curiously, that ties into what we talked about earlier with the notion of returning. Um, so I, I brought the idea of, of you being away from, you know, estranged from your family for 20 years and going back to the hometown, the small town and uh, the expectations that are laid upon you and, and this almost pressure to fall back into uh, the familiar patterns that were there when you were much younger. Well, you know, times that by a thousand for a returning uh, veteran, mm -hmm. right? The world they've, they've just left is so fundamentally different from, from what they left behind. And then when they're expected to return and just seamlessly slip back into the, you know, that mindset and that way of living uh, and to fit um, with a well, more or less functioning society when they've been, you know, spending the last three years or two years in, in a, a broken, non-functional, dysfunctional society um, where conflicts everywhere around you. That um, that's the sort of I think the thing that that is the most tragic to all of this and um i certainly never wanted to um 
gloss over it or um, be dismissive of it. So, yeah, it plays a role. It plays a role. And, and also the notion that when you're in the military, um, you build your families um, around you. And again, it's not a question of um, going to a university and meeting up with like-minded people and suddenly, yeah, you guys are all sort of hanging out together and, and, and you know, you've got, you've built a family. It's an artificial family, but you've built it, right? A friend's. Um, that's not how squads are put together, right? You know, it can be anybody and everybody. Um, so again, it, it's a, it's an unnatural grouping. And then it becomes a challenge to every person in that group. Uh, you know, how do you live together? Um, and, um, how do you manage those, those very, very, uh, disparate experiences, life experiences that, that each person is bringing to that, to that scenario. Um, and this is what a lot of the, the writers of military fiction who have been veterans um, are focusing on and it's what they're exploring. Um, one of the best writers for that is Gustav Hasford uh, with his book, The Short Timers, um, which became a Full Metal Jacket, uh, Kubrick's adaptation of the book. It's it as far as I know, it is okay. Um, going after Cacciato um, is a Mobius strip story, so there's there's magic realism involved. But I think the short timer is, is maybe the only absolutely pure raw uh, Vietnam War novel that has fantasy in it. Hmm. Um, it has one of the most extraordinary scenes that, for some reason, Kubrick never included in the film. But it's it's a fantastic scene and it's surreal and it's just wonderful. So, so all of that stuff sort of I guess feeds into um, the way that, especially since Cam and I were on digs and on digs together and different digs. Um, so when we were gaming, we'd fall back into that that sheer level of I guess absurdity uh, in terms of role playing the characters. So um, that humor always comes through. I think, at least for us, it did. Well, as, as you said, uh, the Melazin books certainly do um, focus a lot on the, on the sort of the, com the this common soldier, the, the, the foot on the ground. Um, but I also find in this book in particular, there is a lot of um, focus on leadership or mm -hmm. and people coming into uh, positions um, where they have to be leaders. Um, thinking of Tavor, um, Temel, who are sort of stepping in to replace Coltane, who is this yeah. like symbol of a perfect, all-knowing leader. Um, so I was wondering if that was something that um, you know we were exploring here. Yeah, um, absolutely, and. It's interesting that it still ties into that that notion of positioning within a family, right? I mean, Memories of Isis is in one respect, if I really simplify it, it's also about it's primarily about motherhood. And so you have sort of mother roles are being played out throughout the entire book, starting in the in the prologue. Um, this one's about siblings. And so um, you know, your two primary uh, movers and shakers for the story are sisters and um, and yet they are estranged from one another and uh, for, at least for one of them is a complete stranger to the other and so it's kind of uh, recognizing that 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 family dynamic is the dynamic of human human interaction it doesn't matter whether it's in the military or anywhere else and so leaders acquire a kind of a parental uh, role, mm -hmm. whether they, they accept it or not. Um, and Strings, of course, Fiddler is finding himself being pushed into that role, one that he certainly didn't have uh, with the bridge burners. So we're, you're, you're going to be able to see his development of, of becoming um, a leader, even though he, he never moves up in rank, but he, he's still where all eyes turn to um, at times of need. So mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of relationship is is and it's going to be played out over and over again amongst all kinds of characters that 
um, there is a familial aspect to, to all of this um, that hopefully is recognizable, at least instinctively, uh, to the reader. Yeah, and I, I also appreciate that um, not everyone is necessarily um, able to cope with that new role that they are given. Um, you have Tabor, who is seemingly becoming this this, this good leader. Um, Felicin, probably not so much, um, but there's also um, Gamet the Fist, who, who is put, who is sort of forced into this position by by Tabor, and um, at the end, just can really live live up to those um, to what's required of him. Like he's not able to make that transition from being a mm -hmm. just a soldier to being a, a a leader. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got a um, uh, another thought uh, as I was reading about Tavor and um, Felison at the you know at the end. Um, you know, Tavor um, she controls her emotions, and Felison was all emotion. Yeah, and um by you know by killing Felison unknowingly um that that sort of communicated that sense of you know shutting down emotion once again and um I thought that was interesting that now we have Felison Younger who um may be inheriting something of Felison her mother in terms of, you know, she's been also uh, harmed, brutally harmed. And so uh, will she seek vengeance or how will she, um, you know, direct her emotions in the future? And it seems for, you know, I'm still trying to figure out Crocus or Cutter's role in what, you know, working with Phyllis and Younger. Um, but um, I, I sense something about that. It, we're heading towards something to do with um, how emotion plays a role in our lives and how um, it's helpful and harmful at the same time. Yeah, I would, to some extent, but um, I would only advise you not to be deceived by the surface uh, appearance. Mm -hmm. um, so one able to constrain any outward display of emotion uh, is not necessarily an emotionless person. Right, right. So everything's down to perception in this card, in this case. And Tavor, as a leader, um, at least her, her, her self-definition of what it is to be a leader is to not show um, emotion. So that's why there's this talk about cold iron versus hot iron and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that is the task that she has assumed and whether or not she can uh, hold on to it for as long as necessary is, is one of her, her main challenges uh, in the series. And we know that she loved Felicin because she did send um, uh, Pearl and Lostera out to, to find them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Can I just say um, the <laughs> chemistry between Pearl and Lostara is perfect. <laughs> right. I, I think sometimes the romance in these books get a bit of a bad reputation, but I think this one is done so well, and I had so much fun with it too. And I always, I always looked forward to seeing them again. Well, um, and I've said this before, but a lot of the banter is actually. Uh, almost copied verbatim from conversations my wife and I we have. So, you know, mm. it fit, it fit well enough. I mean, neither, neither of us are assassins, but apart from that, um, <laughs> a lot of those lines that were dropped there. Yeah. I just sort of plucked from memory. Yeah. They feel very, they feel very uh, lift. They feel very real. Good. Good. Here we did have a comment from, uh, from Ignesh. Uh, Coltane is the most impactful character for me in the series as of now. But so see the characters trace back to his travel in this book was a wonderful look back on trauma and war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely wanted to to physically move those characters. Um, and I don't think this is a big spoiler, but Tabor's army becomes the Bone Hunters. That's what that's the name mm -hmm. they acquire. Um, and so I, 
you know, if you look at the rest of the series, you can see that there's a whole book called The Bone Hunter. So I stay with them. But returning that on that route um, allowed me to to actually kind of re-explore the legacy uh, of the journey. Um, but also uh, it's part of the um, the birth of the bone hunters and 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 they're basically uh, on their way physically um, to a place that is kind of uh, thematically a match to the bridge burner. So if you think of the bridge burners from Gardens of the Moon and, and uh, Memories of Ice, they're in their last last sort of days of existence as as uh, a military force. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of strange to start a series that way with, um, you know, the last days of, of sort of your main military um, focus for the Malaysian Empire. But I knew that um, if I started with the end of the bridge burners, then I could start with the beginning of the bone hunters. And so these, you'd get the full package. Um, so, um, so that this this is their their journey, and of course, they're journeying through recent past and, and mm -hmm. recent events, uh, and seeing just the rubbish left behind, um, the wreckage left behind by that, and that that's kind of their, I mean, it, it, it's a physical metaphor for their answering the rebellion itself, and that's why they're there. So, uh, retracing the steps made sense. Go ahead, Lou. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention that Eric had a comment. Near-death experiences may be tied to prophetic visions. They may well be. Hard to know. And Matt, <laughs> Matt uh, speaking of being emotional after Deadhouse Gates, why you, why are you so mean to us, Mr. Erickson? I think you it was in the, <laughs> in the writing of Deadhouse Gates, I realized that I was less putting... Uh, fantasy elements into, I mean, tragic elements into fantasy than fantasy elements into tragedy. Because it, it suddenly struck me that actually I want to write tragedies. Um, so, because I was interested in the notion of catharsis and um, that pushed me in that direction. But um, I, I knew what, I knew what sort of Coltane's fate was going to be. And it was just a question of keeping the reins, you know, tight, but not, not letting the horse take off on us because, and, you know, a lot of uh, people complain about the chain of dogs being this slog. Well, it's intended to be a slog. That's the whole point. <laughs> um, and without it, you don't get the emotional payoff, at least in my mind. Um, you have to actually go, go with them almost every step of the way to really have the response that I, I'm hoping the reader has when they get to the fall at the end of Dead House Gates. You know, well, I, I certainly did. <laughs> good, good. I, I truly did not see it as a slog. I, I enjoyed those parts. I felt very comfortable in them. I felt like I was getting more information about the characters <laughs> and the nuances between each one. And that's what made it such a, um, a beautiful, tragic ending is because mm -hmm realizing all that that had built up and you know how it came to an end um something a question i do have i haven't quite figured out is i forget the name of the person who ultimately shot coltane it starts squint. with an s squint oh, squint he seems to have been accepted back into the fold if i understand correctly he's not ostracized by uh um is there a point of view from squint in house of chains i don't think so i don't think so yeah wait for it because oh. um, yeah there may be a sense that he's accepted but he doesn't see it that way okay no absolutely okay. not there's a conversation coming don't worry okay all right, good, because I've been worried about him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Eric had a comment. Loved your intro to the Black Company. Uh, is that a, a written one? Uh, was that for the, uh, if you can answer me, Eric, um, I wrote a uh, an intro for, yeah, for the Black Company for a kind of um, 
masterworks kind of series and if that's what you're referring to can you let me know eric um because i would appreciate that because i've just been asked for by another publishing house to write a forward to the black company and um i wasn't aware whether the one i've already written has been published or not ah recent edition it's on the store okay all right thank you all right that means i have to write another forward to, to the black company for a different publisher okay <laughs> And I also had a question, was the Malazan Empire being more of a meritocracy regardless of where they're uh, from in the empire in comparison to Lathar and exploration or more an ideal society? Um, to some extent, yeah. Uh, we, we certainly wanted... Um, okay, there, there was a period in Byzantine history um, when Constantinople was probably the most um, tolerant and diverse, diverse civilization anywhere uh, certainly as a city um and nobody really cared what what you know what people's skin color was nobody cared about um what nation you came from what language you spoke even um and it was just it was a brief brief period um before sort of i guess uh religion sort of reared its head uh, in terms of uh islam and and I, I don't want to get into all that because that's actually about the Crusades more than it is about Byzantium. Um, but there was a period there. And I remember when I was studying that stuff, being really taken by that. Um, and then for the the world building, yeah, we very much wanted, um, we wanted a world that really did not have um, that kind of racism in place and did not have patriarchy either. So, um, by stripping those two things away, um, that helped us build uh, the cultures and the civilizations of, of the Malazan world. Now, when I got to Lether, Lether is very much about, in terms of inspiration, the British Empire. And uh, that's what I built it on. Um, and so I, I, it was built as a counterpoint, certainly to the Malazans. Well, speaking of empires, I, I had a question about um, the the rebellion. So when I read Dead House Gates, and oh, most of it is told from the point of view of the chain of dogs or of the Minalizans, mm -hmm. um, and you sort of get the idea that um, the um, the armies of the apocalypse, like they are doing, like they're committing a lot of very violent acts and just not treating even their own people nicely. Um, but there is still this sense that um, you know these are these are people rebelling against a uh, colonizing power, absolutely uh, power that conquered that uh, mil that basically is is engaged in a military conquest of of their of um, the place where they live. Um, so it's very interesting to me then go to House of Chains and and, and learn more about the uh, the camp of the apocalypse mm -hmm. and uh, see how. Basically, all of the leadership is completely corrupted, um, does not care, does not seem to care about the cause at all, and only only, only seems to pursue their own interests. Um, so I was, I was wondering if like this was your, um, this, this, this is how you view rebellions in general? Um, no, not particularly. Um, for the case of the, uh, uh, the whirlwind, um, the influence of the, I guess, the, the, the godlike powers, uh, like Shaikh. Um, and I think you find out in this one where Shaikh came from. I'm not sure if you do, but I think you do. Yeah. Um, have a, uh, a profound sort of knock-on effect on to how the, 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 the core leaders of that rebellion um, end up basically devouring themselves. Um, so that that kind of was a, a, an overriding in, uh, influencer um, in terms of how I wrote out the the camp uh, in Rarikou. Um But in, in a more general sense, um, the emergence of violence on that level on that scale is kind of um, it doesn't have it doesn't have focus. So it, it, it tends to be destructive of even things that um, 
needn't have been destroyed, if you know what I mean. And so social structure breaks down very quickly. And um, the equivalent of the people with the, with the most guns um, tend to step into the vacuum of, of, of power. Um, and bad things can happen at that point. Um, which is not to say that uh, rebelling against a, a colonial power is um, in any way uh, something I want to be commenting on. I mean, it's, it's part of history and we've seen it played out many times and um, liberation takes many forms. Um, and quite often it's, it's not an easy transition either. So it, it's very much sort of recognizing that it, it's, this isn't a black and white argument, you know, colonialism um, and imperialism and it, it's complicated. And so I want to stay within that complications, right? I, I'm not sort of presenting any particular thesis on this kind of stuff. I'm simply trying to explore how people are living within that. And so there will be examples on all sides. Um, at least I hope so. Anyways, I don't know if that was an answer or not, but <laughs> something I think when I think of the world when, uh, in general, is it's. Um, you know, it, it's grown out of a, a need for, um, it's grown out of pain. It's grown out of a need for vengeance. I'm not sure, but it's definitely mm -hmm. something that's grown out of pain from, uh, you know, um, Onrak and his wife. Um, and um, so, uh, I saw it more as drawing in all of these <clears throat> wounded people as well, you yeah. know, and, and maybe that's where I've got a little bit of confusion because the house of chains also seems to draw in people who have, you know, issues <laughs> like Carsa um, and uh, Hiboric, I believe. Um, so I guess, um, does a whirlwind and the house of chains have a connection? I guess that's the question I'm getting at. You mean the specific house of chains? The, yes. Uh, no, probably only okay. geographically, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't think in, in other respects, mm -hmm. but I also wanted to sort of explore the idea that um the land itself um is a major player in all of this and um those forces um when they're when they're triggered um they're kind of um they don't discriminate in terms of their victims and so that aspect of, of uh i'm trying to think is the house of chains involving the rebirth of Reriku, or is that bone hunters I think uh, is a rebirth when the water comes in. Yeah, yeah, that's House of yeah. Chains. Okay, that's good. Chains. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was dancing around that trying to remember whether <laughs> yeah. it showed up. Or not. Uh, so yes, so the land responds, um, mm -hmm. and if one takes a you know a huge step back, you can see there's a healing consequence to that, mm -hmm. uh, which is I guess also a cultural healing as well. Mm -hmm. So there's all all those things are sort of in play um but you know one of the things that happens um uh, in these circumstances is because uh colonialism and conquest imperial conquest replaces the power structure and the power dynamics uh, of the conquered society and um, so there will be elements within that society that will resist that for obvious reasons because they've lost their power. And so if those elements can then um, incite the general populace uh, into rebellion, then they've, they've got a proper rebellion on their hands and they might well oust the, um, the occupiers. But of course, historically, we know that even when that's done, uh, you you still can't go back to how it used to be, right? Things have changed. Everything changes. Uh, and, and so that, that sense of, of that constant evolution of, of society and culture um, 
is always going to be part of these these stories uh, and part of the themes I'm approaching because mm-hmm. cultures in conflict um, are at least for me uh, historically interesting and uh, emotionally interesting as well. All right. Brian had a question. Was there a particular inspiration for the image of a cruciform dragon? It's been years, but that passage has remained with me. I suppose it's a bit of a uh, Kedida's like, but I am a hum- humanities dullard. Um, Cardicus, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I write visually, so I, I just sort of built the scene. Um, and of course, you know, ha- having read if you've read Dead House Gates, you know that there is, um, I, I am uh, exploring some Judeo-Christian imagery as well, already in place. And so if on occasion I sort of ring that bell again, then, you know, that's why I'm doing that. Um, but I can't remember how I described it, but yeah, it was probably pretty detailed anyways. Yeah, Matt commented. Reading the chain of chain chain of dogs wasn't a slog; it was a witness, and it was witnessing a heartbreaking slog. And and the thing is, I, I was, I mean, there's there's a there's a running joke running all the way through it, um, with respect to Mincer, um, the uh, the leader of the the sappers, and of course, holding off on that as long as I possibly could was, at least for me, a lot of the fun of the writing of it. Um, that you couldn't find him. He never showed up in the officer's um, <laughs> meetings and all the rest. And initially that was accidental. I just accidentally dropped, I forgot about him and, and dropped him out of there. And then I realized that, no, I, I can I can work that and turn it into uh, one particular scene where, where, you know, where everything gets reversed. And it, it allows that moment of humanity to show um, in Coltane. Um, so you were talking earlier about Tavor's uh, basically raising that wall around herself um, in terms of emotional. Well, we saw it, we already saw it in Coltane, didn't we? Um, and so if she's if she's looking for an inspiration, maybe she's drawing on that sense of Coltane um, as a leader. But of course, that that's the moment of humanizing uh, moment for him. Uh, is the whole scene with uh, the demotion of a uh, rank. Yeah. And I uh, also had a question. Is it true that the chains of dogs is in part based yes. on the flight of the Nez Pierce? Yeah. 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 But also the uh, retreat through Afghanistan uh, to the Kabul Pass by the British uh, when they were kicked out the first time. One uh, one scene for me that stood out that was a, uh, it was a, I started to wonder if it was something wrong with me, but uh, the the way Carsa dispatches Bidenthal mm-hmm. was especially satisfying. I thought it was great, but in hearing other other perspectives on it, there was I, I'd heard and and read some other perspectives that it was a little bit um, we shouldn't just kill a character like Bidenthal; he should be punished in other ways. What are your thoughts on that? On on scenes like that on. Uh, you know, death versus other types of punishment for characters? Um, I didn't have to worry about it too much because I knew it was going to be Carsa. It couldn't be, it couldn't be the Malizans, um for all kinds of reasons. Um, it, it was not their punishment to meet. Um, but Carsa as, as an outside agency that um, represents a fairly... Um, almost simplified sense of justice, uh, Mm -hmm. almost eye for eye kind of thing. And so, you know, symbolically, the gesture he makes in killing Bidithal is in perfect keeping with the crimes that Bidithal committed. And as far as Carson was concerned, that was good enough. And I was happy to leave it with that. And um, rather than explore sort of other aspects of of what constitutes punishment. I allowed Carso to be fairly direct and, um, <laughs> and it's fitting. It fits his character and it suits his character. Um, and it seemed appropriate. And, you know, there's something about that whole setting. I really enjoy, you know, in the midst of everyone else's um, aspirations, you know, for power or 
you know, everything that's going on, here comes Carsa in the middle of it, you know, to take care of his business. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love stuff like that where, you know, um, it's not just about the two big, you know, armies clashing. There are all these other motives mm -hmm. and individuals with their own motives, you know, um, acting. And so I, I really, I, I thought that was, um, that whole thing was good. You know, for me, he was, he was going to, I was setting all this stuff up in the camp, but I knew that Carso was going to be the bull in the China shop. And once yeah. he got back, so that was, yeah, that was going to be exactly. a, I felt maybe a little bit differently about uh, Bidithal's debt. I know people get very excited about it, uh, but I, I guess I'm not a big fan of retributive justice. Mm -hmm. um, not, not. I mean, obviously, not that I, you know, approve, approve or agree with, with the things he does. But I think more than anything, his death just made me really sad because I felt like, okay, he's dead, but it doesn't erase anything that doesn't erase a thing you've done it's not going to fix felicin um mm -hmm. so i don't i didn't really see the point of taking pleasure in him dying um, yeah and, and i certainly didn't i didn't write it for purposes of, of taking pleasure in his dying this was consistent to what what how carson would respond to this situation um so that that's you know that's basically his tribal law being enacted there um and so it's just it's done right it's like you know um the legacy and and, and the damage that that Bidithal caused is not something i'm going to leave alone um i'm i'm staying with it um and we're going to see we're going to see uh the victims um have to deal with you know their their the the damage that they've received and um it's like anything else. If you're going to create something like that in fiction, um, it's not the event and it's not even the, the acts or the crimes that are something you should be um, indulging in. You just lay that stuff out uh, in as simple a language as possible, as in a repertorial style, so no emotion attached. Um, but it's the consequences that that's where you have to sort of um allow you know as the writer you allow your own emotions to actually um or rather to allow what that character might be experiencing uh and through your imagination this is the only way we can do this um to seep into uh your mindset and and at that point then yeah you are in that character's skin and um you have to be honest when you're there uh, and you have to be compassionate. Um, and that's the stuff that, that I want to write towards. It, it's not, the action scenes are, they all have a particular plot function and all the rest. Um, but it's the characters that, that um, are my primary interest. I kind of like the rand, randomness of it in, in terms that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that have, done bad they don't always you know get the punishment that that no. should happen but yet you know um sometimes people end up in uh sometimes people end up getting punished and it's not even for what they really should be punished for if that makes sense you mm -hmm. know and so i kind of got that random sense of you know Carsa had his own reasons for what he was doing and it just happened to mesh with you know being with this guy that's just like a really horrible person yeah yeah and of course it's not an easy fit is it because his timing sucked uh he was too late in many respects all right the damage was already done so um yeah it's not an easy fit at all and that that, that felt more realistic in a sense um rather than you know showing up in the nick of time kind of thing and then even as we're talking about that you know that particular um circumcision is actually a, a cultural yep. attribute of some culture. So, you know, while we're, while we're seeing it as a moral issue, um, you know, other cultures and other times, and even now might not see it the same way. Like why was Bidithal killed? Because, hey, you know, 
yeah. um, this is a cultural practice, you know. So yeah, and, and it's it's. I mean, you know, I, I I studied anthropology, and so at the time, at least, and maybe to the to this day, there's always this issue of uh, cultural relativism and moral relativism. Um, you know, where do you draw the line? Where uh, what traditional practices are actually pushing beyond um, uh, what is morally acceptable uh, mm -hmm. in a more general sense. And of course, you know, we've got uh, a human rights commission, we've got, you know, a declar universal declaration of human rights and all the rest. And, um, and if that runs up against something like female circumcision, then you'll see arguments on both sides, you know, um, that this is, this is, was a cultural practice, um, traditional practice or whatever. But at least for me, at some point, um, a moral line is crossed. And that's just, that was sort of my take on it. That, um, I, I, I'm not one who, who would, you know, automatically default to, uh, revering or respecting tradition. Um, a lot of traditions were really, they really sucked. They were bad. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, and so that, that notion of cultural purity, which is the, the counterpoint to the whole thing, right? Because if you're talking about cultural relativism, relativism in terms of uh, what most people would consider inhuman practices, then um, the other side is, what are you defending? You're defending a kind of cultural purity. Um, but cultures are not, they're not solid things. They're constantly changing and, mm -hmm. and they are evolving and they are, they are appropriating from other cultures on a regular basis. Um, they are on occasion expropriating from other cultures. Uh, so they're, they're in a constant state of flux and evolution. And quite often the appeal to, um, cultural purity is actually an appeal to nostalgia. It's how a person remembers themselves growing up within that culture. And of course, it's not the same culture anymore, right? It, it, it changes, it morphs, it changes all the time. Um, so then, you, then you're looking at issues of cultural identity and that's a whole different area, but um, it's complicated. It is very complicated stuff. Yeah, that's why that scene, yeah. you know, that scene invites deep thoughts <laughs> well and, yeah. and that's probably why i chose carsa because yeah you, you know you can end up going down sort of a rabbit hole in terms of uh, ethics and and uh, cultural uh, respect of other other cultures and all the rest uh and i just did not want to go there so uh, i sent carsa <clears throat> a hammer and he just smashed it all up <laughs> he's useful that way yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think I can definitely see you taking a stance there because uh, my experience in most of the characters in Alasin, um, especially the, the the characters that would be considered the the bad guys, is is has been that um, you know even people who seem evil or have <clears throat> bad intentions um, at first sight. I'm thinking maybe someone like Lacine or Tatrin. Like over time, as you get to know them, you realize they're maybe there may be a, a different side to them or they may, may have reasons good mm. reasons for why they're doing what they're what they're doing um but i i i really struggle to find something um good in bitathal yeah and it's it's one of the instances where i guess i actually did you know come down pretty heavily on one side of, of the subject yeah mm. I, I try to avoid it as much as possible but um <clears throat> that was certainly one instance where I guess my horror and revulsion that, that this, this particular practice is continuing to this day um, got to me. Yeah. Uh, Vignesh had a question. Do we see the new Coltane and his development anytime in the bigger Malazan series? Uh, you'd have to read some of Esteban, I think, to get an idea of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt says the Mincer joke payoff was so worth it. I, I, Man, I, I mean, that, that was, yeah, holding the punchline that long was just uh, so much fun. Uh, every drop of Chain of Dogs humor was a, a desperately needed yeah. break. 
Yeah, and if there had been too much, it, it would not have had the same impact. It had to be quite, quite stingy in that area. And you get a peek at Hood, uh, Eric commented. Mm -hmm. uh, from Matt, uh, Benethal desperately needed to be Carsed. <laughs> Could you please introduce Carsed to Malik Rao? Oh, you're being so mean to Malik. Okay. Uh, oh, Austin, our friend Austin's here. I tried to wear his spoilers, but I can't help but be here for the wisdom of Mr. Erickson. No, oh, cool. Thank maker. you. I, I don't see myself as being particularly wise. So, um, <laughs> uh, Carso is going to Carso. Okay, and that, and that, well, that's actually that's an interesting statement. That it, it's an indication then that there's a, I guess, a consistency to Carso that the reader gets and the reader understands. Um, so. I take that as, as a huge compliment, so much appreciated. I uh, had a comment from uh, from Nilfrog. Thank you, Nilfrog. Hi, folks. Th thoughts, on the, thoughts on this particular theme. It's not the gods that are important. It is the sleeping outside of oneself that gifts a moral with virtue. That sounds like a quote from somewhere, doesn't it? It does. You'll have to uh, ascribe that one, Nilfrog. And uh, thank you uh, for the comment and for the super chat. Our friend Daniel, uh, there is so much going on in, in a spoiler Malazan is less than the spoilers you see in a movie preview. Yeah, there's, there's a lot, yeah. And our friend AP is here, Malik Rell of the Merciful, just a misunderstood puppy. Yeah, AP would say that. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, um, a another rabbit hole topic <laughs> to ask about that I've been thinking about a lot, which is... Um, Crocus, who is an outcutter, um, was he once um, al allied with Opan, or was no. it the same relationship? Okay. Yeah, no, no, no alliance there at all. I mean, you'd be you'd be foolish to ever uh, ally with that particular uh, twin god, for sure. And then speaking of that, that's my, this is where my rabbit hole starts because they are Opan. Uh, there's two sides, uh, the lady who has, brings positive luck and the, the Lord who brings not so positive luck or negative. And um, so they're working together. So, but they're, you know, it can't be chance if they're making the decision on what's going to happen but then if they're constantly fighting then they're <clears throat> they're built on emotion so we're back to emotion again mm -hmm. you know that emotion does emotion guide luck or chance um and so i i've been wrestling with this whole idea and if it relates to crocus but now maybe um i don't know i i'm just sensing that um, you know, first there was Opan, now there's Cotillion. Neither is directly influencing Crocus, but they still have had important, um, an important impact on them. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my main rabbit hole is when is it luck and when is it just the, you know, the whim of the lady or the lord well that's a good question um of course <coughs> the, lady or the lord would certainly um be very happy to um, lay claim for virtually anything and everything that happens mm -hmm. um, and just as one one character may be pulled away from something bad the other another kind of character is pushed into it so mm -hmm. they're at work everywhere um <coughs> In terms of their role, it, it begin it's it's already diminishing in the series, and and they become less um, less relevant. Okay. Someone else take takes over that role, um, in many respects, uh, whom you will end up knowing as the errant. Um, and it's it's more it's more I guess a question of um, notions of of fate. And, and what is faded and what isn't um and cause and effect and these kind of things um so 
I guess in a way they personify the chaotic nature of, of the universe. They can go either way at any time. So. I love that. Oh, is it? All right. <clears throat> okay. Right. Was that, must, was that the beginning of a chapter? I don't remember it at all. I'm trying to remember. Right, okay. Um, so I wrote that, did I? Uh, <clears throat> see what I mean? I mean, I don't know. Who was that guy? Who wrote that stuff? It's not me anymore. Well, there are certainly several gods or groups of gods in this book who um, seem to rule under false pretenses. Um, I guess the seven would be uh, the mm -hmm. most obvious example. Um, and there's this sort of in, in discussion about what a god's role should be, um, should there be sort of trying to take care of the people who are who are dedicated to them, or should is it okay if they're just you know extracting services mm -hmm. from them as as the seven are doing? Um, I'm also thinking about Osric, who is seemingly the god of the uh, Taisleosan, but somehow seems okay with just having someone else do the all the all the uh old work for him yeah yeah the relationship between um that which is worshipped and the worshipers is is uh it's going to be explored throughout the entire series for sure okay so nifarog is telling me that it's uh one of the jade souls talking to her work yeah those conversations um yeah, those were interesting. Those were sort of this world intrusions um, into the Malazan world. Maybe I'm giving too much away there. But um, uh, and I can't tell you if, uh, if I'm actually quoting anybody else. I don't think so. But I may be quoting a particular philosophical um, position um, that I may have read somewhere here in this world. The, the jade statues are some of the weirdest things that I've encountered in Malazan so far. Like, I, I, after reading well, six of these books, I'm still so, like, it's so out there that I have no yeah. idea what's going on. Yeah, that sort of um, almost disembodied arguments that were going on. Um, thinking back, I was probably reading some of Ian M. Banks' culture novels at the time. And, of course, the, uh, the AI ships have conversations like that all the time. So maybe there was an influence there. Hmm. Uh, JD yeah. Racing commented, uh, yeah. HOS really explored the daily life of a soldier without a battle. Enjoy the humor. Great. Cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that Leila and I talked about last time, I believe it was either the first video or the second about the women soldiers and the men soldiers being, oftentimes you forget what, what their genders are. So I really, really like that. There was something that we talked about. Uh, in the last discussion is that that was uh really like those those characters that you you forget whether they're men or women well i mean often i forgot i i you know i'd have to have lists <laughs> because the names just sort of come in and then the names arrive uh, and i uh, create the squad and even at by that point i do not even know what gender uh they happen to be just the names have arrived um and then i give them their their abilities and again, I, I, I don't ascribe gender until I'm actually forced to um, by putting them into the story. So, yeah, it's all sort of ability based more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, come into the Jade Soul scenes is the, is the trippy craziness <laughs> at the end of 2001 <laughs> Space Odyssey. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't forget, I read a lot of, well, I read a lot of science fiction. But I read a lot of nonfiction, especially uh, philosophy, um, and and weird other shit. So uh, <laughs> it's not too surprising that that was trippy. I certainly struggle with the ending of that film as well. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, who didn't? Uh, biggest bad was a fun to write. Uh, Korab, Bilhan. I... Yeah, yeah, he's almost. Um, almost a counterpoint to Carson in many ways, right? I mean, he's uh, 
He's similar to Carson, now that I think about it. Um, almost a, a slightly different take on the Carson style character. Um, I mean, both were sort of initially founded upon uh, misplaced beliefs uh, in, in, in their leaders, gods, whatever you want to call them. Um, and there's an earnestness, earnestness to, uh, to Korab, which uh, was certainly great fun to write. Um, and I mean, I do like going into characters and doing some stream of consciousness style writing and his voice turned out to be a lot of fun. And especially, you know, I think after his, his mushrooms or whatever he, whatever he was taking at the time. Yeah. Good fun. Eric brings up an interesting uh, point that I think, uh, it's fresh in our minds because we've been reading, uh, both series, but mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting comparing the themes of worship and Malazan to Baker. Right. Yeah. Um, they're very different. Those themes. Yeah. 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 Almost, yeah. Opposites. Pretty much. I would think. Yeah. yeah. What do you think <coughs> Rina, with, uh, Baker being fresh in your mind too? Man. Sorry. Oh, I was, I was seeing if Katarina had thoughts on that. Cause we've, right. we've been reading the, the series together. Mm hmm. I think that, that's a really hard question to answer on the spot, to be honest. Um, I think maybe Baker focuses on all the other things about faith besides actual faith or people believing in God. Um, and I mean, just the gods in, 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 in Malazan, I think, play a very different role than they do in, in in baker's work um they're they're much more active and much more much more present um in the scenes um whereas in, in baker they remain very much mysterious for um most of the books i would say but i have to do some heavy thinking to like give you a new like give you like an answer that i would be actually uh content with Sorry, I didn't mean it. I know it's late for you. It's so I don't want to string it on you. Uh, also, had a question What's the weird other shit? Uh, you uh, you're quoting me, and I've already forgotten what I was saying. <laughs> oh, you said you uh, the stream of consciousness uh, portions that you like to write and kind of go off on. Um... Well, yeah, doesn't he, or has that not happened yet? Doesn't he get completely stoned at one point? Hippore? No, Korab. Mm -hmm. Oh. Maybe not uh, yet. Not yeah, yet. I, I think also is asking because uh, you said you you read a lot of uh, weird other shit. Oh, other with, shit that yeah. way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of stuff. Um, human evolution books, uh, cosmology, uh, quantum stuff. Um, I'm sort of all over the place. I, I, I'm rereading um, Julian Jaynes right now. Um, his book, The Origin of Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, which is one of my favorite titles ever. Um, and it's a great book. It's a fabulous book. Oh, that's, thanks, uh, that's the next book. Yeah. Uh, JD, comments, you really create a lot of soldiers that we read, care a lot about, a lot about for them uh, to start as ability based. Very cool insight to your process. Well, the, the ability and their names. Uh, Quite often, the name is is something that really uh, sends me in a particular direction with that character, and um, sometimes the opposite of what the name implies. Um, but it's still a direction that's that's related to that name in some fashion. And then it's more a case of uh, if I'm going to use them as a point of view, um, I sort of. Uh, step lightly to begin with um usually until i, I kind of find my feet and, and figure out who they are and what they're up to um are the ones just blast their way onto the page and, and they're in place immediately so it, it varies um matt's wondering if you have any other good or what other good ssf uh, have you read this year um all right i'm gonna go out on a real limb here um I've been reading a self-published series, and um, uh, I guess it's uh, Amazon is, is publishing them. And I'm really, I'm, I'm really actually quite impressed. And the author's name is B.B. Larson. Hmm. 
And the titles are all kind of Steel World, Dust World, Home World, Machine World, etc. And um, I'm ripping through them right now. And um, I'm actually really, um, the writing's, the writing's good. Uh, the characterization's fantastic. It's sort of, if you can imagine a Jack Reacher in space, you know, in, in a military setting, um, it, it's a good character and, and, and quite consistent all the way through. So yeah, I've been having a blast with that stuff. Hmm. Was added to the list, and that, that's a uh, that's a lot of the weird shit he re also reads too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place when it comes to that stuff. And I did not forget your comment, Frank. If you're still here, uh, which hockey teams do you cheer for? Uh, the Winnipeg Jets and the Edmonton Oilers. I know. I know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, they're doing okay right now. That's mm -hmm. So uh, we don't want to keep you too long. Uh, no, Kevin or, right. or Layla, did you have any any questions that? I I did. Yeah, I have a, a few actually. Cool. But one one I want to circle back to um, you know Phyllis and the younger and Haboric and Haboric did heal. Um, is it Sibylla? Do I have her name right? Solara. Uh, Solara. Solar. Oh, Solara. He, he healed her, but um, in this book anyway, he did not heal Phyllis and the Younger. And then um, now she, it seems she's, well, no, he's still with her. So he could still heal her, but that would under maybe undercut the reason Crocus or Cutter is with her. So, uh, he may not. Have, I don't remember, but he may not be aware that she needs healing. Okay. Uh, if if there's no uh, obvious observable um, injury. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, there, there's there's plenty more to come uh, for that from that group of characters. You're going to meet them again. So. Yeah, and there seems to be a um, a significant significance of spiders like we have a spider with the snakes um you know lure i guess a spider who lures lures prey by pretending to have a be a snake and then we have is girl pus wife who is um a divers yeah she's a divers uh, into spiders who can turn into spiders so mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that a read and find out? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you're going to meet Hellion. Or have you met Hellion yet? No. Not sure. No? Okay. No? <laughs> right. Okay. Wait till you meet Hellion. She'll tell you all about spiders. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't mind spiders. Um, spiders in the house, they I, I, I never kill them. They go outside. I, I put them, you know, put the glass on top and postcard underneath and, and send them out. Um, I've had a pet tarantula when i was much younger mm. in university uh mexican red and black tarantula named quiche mm. lorraine and and she used to escape everywhere she just she would escape get out of the you know the aquarium and i'd have to hunt through the house until i found her so i like spiders me too we have uh orb weavers here in missouri where yes they, of course they weave those giant webs and just sit there and I love them. I mean, you know, yeah. I mm. wouldn't want to be bitten by a spider, but um, yeah. Oh, like, that, yeah. Yeah. It was a spider bite that, that, at least to my mind, came as close to killing me as anything mm. I've experienced before. And that was in Mongolia. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Even though there's not supposed to be any venomous spiders in Mongolia. Take it from me, there is. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, another question I have is uh, what I've missed the significance of diamonds, like significance to Israel Pust and why Callum brought them, why Cotillion couldn't just give them to Israel Pust himself. Or am I mixing up the chain of um, possession of the diamonds? You know what? I don't even remember. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Other people are going to have to I weigh in on that one. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think one other just 
idea that's hanging out in the back of my mind is the characterization of Lacine, because we only really know Lacine from a little, you know, a bit in Gardens of the Moon, but I was not aware at that time as mm -hmm. much as I am now. Mm -hmm. And now she almost seems to be, I'm going back to the whole, you know, thing about luck and fortune, just, um, you know, very, uh, it's very unpredictable. Um, and she seems to have schemes within schemes. And it's really her influence that is causing all of this other mayhem to go on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I just find that very fascinating that um, when, okay, for example, when Tavor uh, or Tavore uh, sent Felison to the mines um, and, you know, did all she did to her family, her parents. Um, Lacine would have already known that Gano's Perrin was not, uh, had not dishonored his family. I, I mean, she had to have known that. So, well, hard to say, right? I mean, yeah. um, quite often what happens to, to somebody who's at the, the very top of, of the hierarchy Mm -hmm. is information has to go through many filters to reach them and may never reach them. Um, not only that, uh, you know, the, the triggering of the act of the um, nobility cull, uh, it's not the first time that's happened in the empire. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it acquires its own momentum for sure. Mm -hmm. So Tavor had basically, you know, two options, right? Either um, kill her sister or um send her away and yeah. by sending her away she at least gave her the chance um and she put things in place to to assist in that matter it was the best she could do so, yeah yeah you'll see more of the scene um especially in the bone hunters yeah i just found it fascinating that you know like lestara was saying i'm going to be loyal to the Empress and everyone's talking about loyalty and yet we we haven't seen the, the Empress, we haven't seen the impact of whether she cares about the loyalty or not. And I guess I was using the example of the Perrin family mm -hmm. to kind of make that make those assumptions. If yeah. she's not paying attention to them, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean the thing with it is really a reversal of a lot of what you see in, in, in um, sort of Eurocentric medieval epic fantasies where um, the story is, is very much focused on, on those people in power. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, most of us live our lives um, nowhere near those people in power. And yet their decisions, their actions and inactions have this. It's not just a trickle down effect. It's an avalanche mm -hmm. effect. And, um, and, but I want to be down there on the ground, you know, and that experience of things where you don't have the answers to these questions. You don't know the motivations of, of your rulers. You don't know to the extent to which they're compromised um, or whether they're ethical or not, but you have to deal and live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. That's, um, you know, there's this kind of shifting gears for a minute, but there's this whole thing in, in history, you know, now, or over the last 30 years, I guess, you know, the history from below and Social history. Yeah. 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 My history and that kind of thing where you're looking at the lives of individual people and this, I'm kind of relating that to this now too. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and I mean, it was long overdue in terms of, of history. Uh, it was one of my minors uh, was history and, uh, social history is, is, uh, yeah, it's where to me it's where the interesting stuff is because it, it's it's on a human scale as opposed to a monumental or um, uh, imperial uh, scale, which yeah. is you know a, a different kind of history and doesn't really take you anywhere. Um, it's just basically a succession of rising and falling of empires, you know, and it's like okay, <laughs> that's done. Now what? Um, so it takes uh, social historians, um, cultural anthropologists, and that kind of thing to 
really start examining um, some of the assumptions that we've made regarding our past and um, and kind of dismantling those assumptions, which is you know long overdue for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Judy Reason had a question. Uh, what are your and Eslamont's most fleshed out characters before you decided to create the books? Um, <laughs> most fleshed out. If I had to guess, this is going to sound weird. Um, Anamander Rake. Um, some of Kaladin Brood, I think, on my part. And for Cam, it would have been uh, Osric. Osric. Um, I'm trying to think if there were... Well, no. Uh, okay, obviously, uh, Cotillion, or Dancer, and, and Wu, Kellenbed. Yeah, they're, they're, they were... They were there at the beginning. Well, almost the beginning. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> here's a writing question related to that. How um, do you ever find yourself uh, writing autobiographically in a character? You know, because when they say when, and it's true, when you first start writing, you tend to be autobiographical mm-hmm. in your writing. People do. Um, so you, do you find yourself having to step back at a certain time and saying, no, this character would make this decision. It's not the decision I would make, you know, how, um, how yeah, you- I certainly try to, okay. It's funny because I, I'm actually writing uh, about this in the, in my book on writing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one of the things where fiction deviates from reality you know, to a large extent, but it's, it's expected to. And that is the notion of consistent characters mm-hmm. because there's an expectation among readers when you're reading a book that, you know, the character needs to be consistent throughout the story. Now mm-hmm. they can be uh, evolving. They can be, you know, um, changing in that respect, but that at, at some core level, they are consistent. The reality is none of us are consistent. We are, mm-hmm. we are profoundly inconsistent as, as individuals and we can carry contradictory notions in our heads and we're perfectly, at least I'm perfectly comfortable with that mm-hmm. um, in my own mind. So it is kind of a, a conceit um, to think in terms of characterization and consistency within a story. But at the same time, stories often need that. And so you, you, you kind of have to, you have to walk that, that tightrope on these things and, and allow your characters enough room um, to do, you know, batshit crazy stuff that is just not, not consistent with who they were. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they can then turn around and give you a reason for why they did it, then it should stand. It should be part of the story. Um, now, in terms of autobiographical, no, I would say I may use particular details to add verisimilitude uh, to the set, the scene uh, that I'm writing, um, which we all have to do. I mean, it's what we what we've observed of our world um, that we make use of in, in creating our fictional worlds. So, uh, what else could we do, mm-hmm. right? Um, so there may maybe small elements uh, and, and some sort of little autobiographical tidbits here and there, um, and uh, those will show up. But generally. Uh, I really, I, I, I want to sink into the characters and the world uh, as much as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I'm just sort of, um, yeah, I'm throwing on various masks and um, living out those roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to comment today? I tend to enjoy characters that are inconsistent at times. Contradictions seem realistic. Yes, I agree. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Joanna. Yeah. And, you know, characters that are constantly <clears throat> consistent. They, they could get pretty boring, right? And you know, everybody else around them will be able to predict pretty easily what they're going to do, which is, seems to be a, um, a not a good survival uh, tactic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in fencing, right? You know, when I was fencing, if I got fell into any kind of pattern of movement or, or, or pacing, or um, you know, two steps advancing, one retreating, and then counterattacking, and that kind of stuff, I'd be toast, right? you've got to break everything up. You cannot be consistent. You cannot be predictable. Um, and you cannot fall into those rhythms. 
So, I mean, sword fighting alone should tell you that. Um, uh, keep, you know, don't become predictable in, in any respect. Uh, Matt commented, I don't know if there was a reason, but Kalam had no, had to use the diamond before he gave some of them to Pust. Yeah, I, you may well be right, Matt. I have no memory of that subplot at all. So, uh, GD Raising, uh, Lacine figured someone should be in power. If the Emperor doesn't seem to care, you got to read some Esselmont. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, she plays a huge role in uh, Return of the Crimson Guard. Yeah. Mm. Uh, also, what do you think of the book Dawn of Everything? Oh, man, it's one of my favorite books. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's um, David Graeber, who recently passed away, and David Wingrove, um, an archaeologist and an anthropologist, completely dismantling uh, the paradigm of the rise of uh, civilization. Fabulous, fabulous stuff. My my reading schedule is getting pretty <laughs> pretty <laughs> passionate with this conversation. <laughs> That's it part of the fun. sounds fascinating, though. That it does. Hmm. What? No, it sounds fascinating. Oh, it is. It yeah. is. Yeah, David Graeber also did one, I think, 10,000 Years of Death. Uh, he talks about the history of death, D-E-B-T. Also fantastic. Writing these down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go, um, I may just want to go very quickly back to Felicin once more. Mm -hmm. um, because she's just such a wonderful fascinating character i absolutely adore her in in dead house gates and she went on a terrible but mm -hmm. what a journey she, she she goes through in 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 that book and the way the way uh, dead house gates ends um you know i i was and I, maybe i was naive, well obviously i was naive in thinking that you know she um by becoming the Shaikh, she was giving this she was given this this new opportunity to to as we sort of talk about reinvent herself mm -hmm. and maybe sort of come into her own um and it was very it was very disheartening to then see her as the Shaikh in in uh, house of chains um and to see that you know just despite all the trauma like what what really happens is just the the goddess of eventually takes over her and she has very little agency once yeah. again um so i was wondering if was was that always the ending you had intended for for felicin or was there ever yeah. hope that you know <clears throat> she might find some peace well uh, i don't i mean maybe she did find peace in the end um but the the clash between the sisters was always going to be the, the end of the fourth book. Um, and there were a number of reasons for that. One, um, things that, things that I ramped things up a fair bit with dead house gates and its conclusion. Right. So you think it's sort of, um, kind of monumental in terms of the involvement of, of everything. So huge scale. And then, I felt in, in Memories of Ice, I actually upped it yet again, one more time. Um, but I didn't want, did not want to fall into that pattern of going for the, the, the great spectacle uh, at the end of every book. So I thought with the fourth book, I would completely inverse it. And I go back to uh, a lot of what inspired me to start in all of this stuff, which was, of course, the Iliad. And um, you know, you can look at the Iliad in, in terms of the, the, the huge siege uh, on, on a grand scale, but the story itself is not about that siege. It's about the individuals um, and their contests and their fights and uh, ultimately Achilles and, and Priam. So uh, that's what I was trying to echo with this one. Is this was going to come down to two people on a field uh, between two armies and deciding everything at that point. Um, so yeah it was turning the focus uh turning it around um just to sort of i guess not fall into a particular pattern of uh, storytelling uh, and structure um and then of course i realized that i needed to make sure that tavor never knew who it was that she killed so uh, that was the other side of things and in terms of the control of of the goddess uh, over over uh, felicin 
um, that control slips briefly. Um, and that's kind of what sort of leads to her, her demise. Uh, she has a moment when she's, she finds herself again. And to me, I needed that for the tragic aspect of things, uh, for that co conclusion. Um, but yeah, it, it was certainly going for um, a kind of a messy ending, you know, in, in that respect. Yeah. It, it was sort of, it was heartbreaking to read and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sad for sad about how Felicin ends up, but some, well, at least I'm happy that we have her as a character. Okay. Well, remember that scene and put that scene on a shelf uh, mm -hmm. and get back to me when you're reading um, towards the end of the crippled God. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it in mind. Yes. No, you know, some of um, that too, I, I see in a, uh, a loose parallel, I guess, to the Benethal death in that, you know, no matter how deserving we might be, you know, maybe this is the grim dark side of me coming out, no matter how bad you are or how deserving you are it you know nothing ever wraps up neatly no. i think that's what i'm getting at no. you know and because i saw fellison as a uh i still do as um uh, a tragic and heroic figure i mean she went through a lot and survived mm -hmm. and um you know yeah, and and that that survival legacy lives on in the renamed uh, daughter, right? For listen, right. So the name carries on. Yeah. Yeah. I think my last question uh, is, uh, will we see Grub again? Yeah. <laughs> Read and find out. Okay. <laughs> it looked like the promise was there. Mm. So. Um, but not in the way you expect. So. Okay. But take that take that as a given, right? You know, yeah. It, it's it's it, it won't be in the way you expect things. Um, that's kind of the rule throughout the entire series, actually. Yeah, yeah. but you know, he basically has given the Bone Hunters their name. Mm -hmm. You know, by his original innocent act with mm -hmm. the the thigh bone. Yeah. So. Yeah. The time always flies on these. It <laughs> does. Yeah, it just flies by. But uh, and we we know you're very busy. We really appreciate you taking time to come and. Oh, it's been fun with us. Yeah, it's good fun. Yeah, well, well, uh, I look forward to hearing your comments on Midnight Tides for sure. Mm -hmm. Talk about messy endings. Yeah, you just wait. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, Layla, thank if, you. If, oh, I'm sorry, Katerine. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, was just going to thank uh, Mr. Erickson for, for joining, for joining us and allowing us to uh, ask all these questions. And uh, yeah, I'm also curious what you think of Midnight Tides because I've already read it and that's mm -hmm. it's one of my favorites. So all right, cool. Um, okay, it's curious pretty, about your it's quite standalone, isn't it? It's quite self-contained that book, I think, in many respects. Yeah. Yeah, I think you could possibly even re read it before reading any of the other mm -hmm. books, and it might still work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it's quite yeah. different uh, from the from the other four as well. Yeah, a bit more deliberately Shakespearean, I think, in many respects. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, we're well, looking forward to mm -hmm. it now. Good stuff. Uh, so, uh, Layla, if someone wants to get in touch with you, where's the best place to find you? Um, I guess Twitter now, either my regular El Goshi or uh, Aladdin Magazine now. Yes, yeah, new uh, new channel launch, and I'll be sure and add that down to the description. Everybody could go check it out. And uh, Mr. Erickson, where's the best place for people to find your work? Um, <clears throat> bookstores. Uh, <laughs> right now, uh, I, I'm occasionally putting an essay up on my uh, Erickson Facebook page, so I have the introduction to the the book on writing is is up there right now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. And Katerina, where can people get in touch with you? Uh, you'll find me on the page chewing forum and, uh, I'm also on Instagram at, uh, the errand. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, might might have might have stolen that one from you. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, that's uh. How far along are you again? You finished the Bone Hunters, is that right? I finished the Bone Hunters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You might end up changing your, you know, your handle at some point. <laughs> oh no. I, I thought I thought it sounded more interesting than just using my name, but okay. Right. Well, I might I might have to rebrand myself again. You might have to, yeah. yeah. And for for everyone here, the um, <laughs> we are continuing to read the series. So if you want to join us or join the conversation, we are on the page two in forum. Be sure and check that out and come by. Uh, I'm not sure the format we'll continue with. We were trying a book at a time, but we'll we'll be figuring that out here soon, just to kind of uh, get our strategy down. But anyone's welcome to join and uh, come and chat about the series with us. So thanks again to everyone in the chat. Really appreciate everyone coming by to, to talk with us. It always adds to the to the experience. So thanks a lot for coming by and, and asking a bunch of great questions. And we'll see everyone next time. Hope everyone has a great, uh, great weekend. Bye.